Many thanks. And we are back now with our panel. All right, Doug is the resident Republican. Uh, CPAC, so you saw President Trump being the headliner. He won the straw poll. Who is CPAC's audience at this point? You know, CPAC's audience is really kind of a niche within the Republican Party. It's a loud activist base, but it's not the broad Republican Party. Donald Trump's still the alpha dog of the party. I think we can all agree on that. But some of his endorsed candidates win. Some of them don't. We're, what we're seeing is a diminishment of his standing within the party, but a small one, right? A small diminishment, a small erosion. And that's where Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, who sure was, was not coy about what she might want to do, you know, in the coming months, are starting to step up and be more and more vocal. Pro-life advocacy a major theme at CPAC, uh, but a pro-choice win in your home state of Kansas this week. How big of a deal? Well, Democrats and Republicans are telling me not to blow this out of proportion. It was one state, and, and abortion was literally on the ballot in Kansas. This was a ballot measure, and that doesn't necessarily translate to Democratic wins in Senate races and gubernatorial races this cycle. But there are some states that are looking at ballot measures. In Michigan, for instance, you could see abortion on the ballot in Michigan, and there is a major gubernatorial race taking place there, too. So it is something that could drive, in both parties, voters to the ballot box, but overall voters are most concerned about the economy. They are very concerned about inflation, but abortion rights also in the top three issues. How does this win, Mo, change the calculation for Republicans in the midterms? I realize you're on the other side of the aisle, but your thoughts on what this means? Well, you know, look, I think there's a reason why Doug is one of the smartest message guys in uh, in the Republican Party and earlier saying that if Republicans are laser -like, have a laser-like focus on inflation, it should be a good year for them. Luckily for Democrats, most Republican candidates are not listening to Doug High right now. <laughs> they never the, have. The fact, that's why you and I are on TV now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, the, 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 the fact is that more and more the candidates who are being nominated in these Republican primaries are more focused on issues like election denialism. Are, we're out there celebrating in the streets when the Hobbs decision came down and said that they were going to drive more restrictive uh, measures on abortion um, in whatever offices they won. They're focusing on the issues that you heard at CPAC. You weren't seeing a lot of panels at CPAC on inflation. You were seeing panels on the 2020 election and whether it was stolen. Mm -hmm. You weren't seeing big thought leaders speaking on how to, uh, on delivering a conservative economic message. You saw Viktor Orban as the, as the keynote. The, the base of the party right now, I agree with Doug, is not reflective of where most of the party is. The fact is, in Kansas, I don't know if you should read too much into it, but 20 percent of Republicans about voted with the Democrats and the independents to protect abortion rights. There is a big central centrist coalition out there. It feels like Democrats are speaking more to them. They're not speaking to the Democratic base right now. They're speaking more to them, whereas Republicans who are speaking to the CPAC crowd might end up being the ones uh, uh, a little bit more out of step. And, and Mike, here electorally is why that matters. Think of Christine O'Donnell, Sharon Engel, Richard Murdoch, Todd Akin. What do they all have in common? They won their nomination and lost the general election. Republicans have left four Senate seats on the table in the past 10, 12 years, and Mitch McConnell is very fearful of some of the Republican candidates and gubernatorial candidates doing the same thing this so cycle. So let me follow up. So is this energy over abortion, does that cost Republicans House seats, Senate seats, governor's races? Um, governor's races, I think, is where you start to look at that, Pennsylvania and Arizona being the two prominent examples. Otherwise, it's really hard to extrapolate Kansas affecting a particular congressional race, but it's that larger conversation. And so as we have these trigger laws, as we have other measures on the ballot, Republicans, if you're not talking about inflation, you're losing your you're losing your message. And the one thing I'll say, the one thing I think you can look at Kansas and 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 really take note of was the turnout, mm -hmm. right? You saw presidential level turnout in a primary where there was really no big Democratic primary going on, mm -hmm. right? There's and the, new voters. The energy has shifted a bit, and that's something. And to no watch. doubt in Kansas, you did see in conservative rural counties, uh, in some cases, 40 percent of people voting no on that ballot measure. But I want to come back to the point that you made, Doug, about these untested candidates. The concern I'm hearing from conservative activists is that when Republicans aren't prepared to talk about abortion, that you could come into instances where you run into races that 
should have been safe seats or competitive seats for Republicans, no. and then candidates make missteps because they were not prepared to define their position no. on the issue. Aisha, let's bring you in on yeah. midterms here. So <laughs> publicly, Republicans say midterms will all be about President Biden and inflation. Let's, let's play a clip from Senator John Kennedy of the great state of Louisiana. I think a majority of Americans, of Americans right now are thinking to themselves, Republicans are not perfect, but the other side's crazy. And I think that'll be reflected in the elections. Aisha, he sounds confident, but are Republicans nervous behind closed doors? I, I don't think that they're confident uh, publicly or privately. I think if you listen to Mitch McConnell, who just spoke with Brett Baer on special report right here in this room, I don't think that you hear confidence. I think he was preparing everybody for the worst case scenario, saying that he wasn't sure that they were going to be able to take back the Senate. And I think it's baffling when all you need is to flip one state. You have four flippable states, and you're seeing Trump back candidates not doing well. Take Pennsylvania, for example. Dr. Oz is trailing behind Fetterman when he had the entire space mm -hmm. uh, to campaign pain freely because Fetterman was still recovering from a stroke, didn't take advantage of that. Down in Georgia, you're seeing the same thing with uh, Herschel Walker uh, trailing behind as well. I think Republicans privately know what the problem is, and they know that it, it, it is these candidates. I think publicly, they continue to endorse, to support, and to campaign for these candidates. And at the end of the day, if these candidates can't win, it's you can't just point the finger at Trump. They're going to be pointing the fingers at each other, too. Okay, meanwhile, we've got uh, Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, out with a pretty slick ad. We're, we're tight on time, Doug, but um, your thoughts on what this means about his 2024 ambitions? Oh, look, he's ready to go, and all he wants is to hear what Donald Trump is going to do or not do. And when Donald Trump makes a decision, you you'll wait. Hello. If, if he announces, if the first person who announces is going to be the first person in Donald Trump's sights. I wouldn't advise any Republican to be that person. Okay. All right. Thanks, panel. <laughs> See you next Sunday. Up next, we're on the road to the midterms in Wyoming, where we stop by Frontier Days to find out what voters think about the uphill